In this segment, we're going to talk about confidence intervals. Confidence intervals help us understand the range of variability or uncertainty uh, in either our measure of association or our measure of disease occurrence. After you, you have reviewed this segment, you should be able to interpret both statistically significant and non-statistically significant measures of association or measures of disease occurrence and their confidence intervals. Sometimes you might see a measure of disease occurrence or a measure of association accompanied by a confidence interval. What is a confidence interval? Confidence intervals are a statistical construct that provide us with information about a range in which the true value lies with a certain degree of probability, as well as information about the direction and strength of the effect. Since we don't know the true value of, say, a risk ratio or an odds ratio, we calculate their estimates. Confidence intervals let us know how much our estimates of these measures of association might vary. We can answer the question, what is the range of uncertainty about our estimate? If we perform an experiment a hundred times and calculate an estimated risk ratio each time, the 95% confidence interval is expected to contain the true value of the risk ratio 95 out of a hundred times. 95 is a commonly used confidence interval. However, sometimes you might also see 90 or 99% confidence intervals. A quick clarification on interpretation. When interpreting a 95% confidence interval, is it correct to say that there is a 95% probability that the true value lies within the interval? And the answer is no, that is not correct. A probability is re relevant to a process, not a specific interval. Here is the mathematical formula for 95% confidence interval. The measure of association could be a risk ratio, a prevalence odds ratio, a rate ratio, etc. You take that estimate and then subtract 1.96 times the standard error of the point estimate to get the lower 95% uh, confidence bound. To get the upper 95% confidence bound, you add 1.96 times the standard error. Note that the 1.96 is specific to the 95% aspect of the confidence interval. If you wanted to calculate the 99% confidence interval, you would use the number 2.575. And for a 90% confidence interval, you would use the number 1.645. Since this is an introductory epidemiology MOOC, we are not going to get into the details of how you calculate the confidence intervals by hand mathematically, but it is possible to do so. What does a confidence interval look like? It has a lower bound and an upper bound. In this example, the 95% confidence interval is 1.9 to 4.1. In this example, if you conducted the study 100 times, approximately 95% of those times, the true value would be contained between the interval of 1.9 and 4.1. You might ask when looking at this uh, diagram here, why is the estimate not equidistant from the lower and upper bounds of the 95% confidence interval? The answer is that the confidence interval for uh, ratio measures of effect, such as the odds ratio, rate ratio, or risk ratio, are computed using a logarithmic scale. If you take the logarithm, you will see that the point estimate is equidistant from the lower and upper bounds. Here's an important point I would like you to remember. The measure of association or point estimate, i.e. the risk ratio, odds ratio, etc., will always be somewhere between your upper and lower confidence interval. If it isn't, this is a good indicator that something went wrong in your calculation. For beginning epidemiology students, there is free software available that you can use to calculate 95% confidence intervals. These include OpenEpi and EpiSheet. Using either of these spreadsheets, you can plug in the numbers for each of the four cells in a 2x2 two two table. These spreadsheets then calculate the standard error and the related 95% confidence intervals. So what is a p-value? Study results are a combination of real effects and chance. The p-value is a probability that tells you whether the study results are consistent with being due to chance. The p-value does not tell you if the study result was due to chance. P-values alone do not let us to directly say anything about the direction or size of a difference or measure of association between different groups. So what do the p-value and 95% confidence interval tell us? Well, first we know that the 95% confidence interval has a relationship with the p-value. And if the 95% confidence interval does not include the null value, it is called statistically significant. 
When a p-value is less than alpha, which is usually chosen as 0.05, it may be called statistically significant. Uh, when you have a statistically significant result, it means that you can reject the null hypothesis that there's no association between the exposure and the, he the health outcome. Confidence intervals contain more information than a p-value. A confidence interval also tells us the magnitude of the association between the exposure and the disease, and it also tells us about the precision of the estimate we obtained. The narrower the confidence interval, the more precise the estimate. A clear distinction must be made between statistical significance and clinical relevance in epidemiologic studies. The same numerical value for the results may be statistically significant if a large sample size was used, and not significant if the sample size was smaller. However, study results of clinical relevance are not automatically unimportant just because there is no statistical significance. So now let's look at these 95% confidence interval examples. Which of these confidence intervals is or are statistically significant? Which is the most precise? And another question to think about, are narrower confidence intervals more significant? So if the confidence interval does not cross the null value, in this case 1.0 because we're talking about a ratio measure, then the confidence interval is statistically significant. Of the examples listed, A, B, and C, C is statistically significant. C is statistically significant because it does not cross the null value. A and B do. B is a more precise confidence interval compared with A and C. Why is that? Well, B is more precise because the confidence interval is more narrow or smaller compared with A and C. As A is the widest interval of these three examples, it is the least precise confidence interval. As I pointed out in one of the previous slides, statistical significance of the confidence interval depends on whether the confidence interval includes the null value. So while B is a more precise estimate, it is not statistically significant because it includes the null value of 1. So here's a quick example for you to test your understanding. In this example is the risk ratio estimate 2.8 with its 95% confidence intervals of 1.9 to 4.1. Statistically significant? And the answer is yes. This risk ratio estimate is statistically significant as the 95% confidence interval of 1.9 to 4.1 does not include the null value of 1.0. This concludes the segment on confidence intervals. Uh, the most important things to take away from this uh, segment in, and understanding uh, how to interpret confidence intervals and their statistical significance uh, is if the confidence interval uh, does not include the null value, then it is statistically significant. Uh, and so for um, the null value for ratio measures is 1, and for difference measures it's 0. So if, uh, for example, if a rate ratio confidence interval uh, does not include the value 1, then it is statistically significant. And if we were talking about a difference measure, measure such as a risk difference, and the confidence interval around the risk difference uh, did not include the null value of 0, um, then it would be statistically significant. So hopefully you can use this information when you're um, reading articles or uh, reading uh, newspaper articles uh, uh, that, that actually include a confidence interval and it will help you understand the uncertainty around that uh, measure of association or measure of disease occurrence.